So much of the debate about development finance recently has focused on very big money, how to raise the billions and trillions of dollars needed for infrastructure and to meet the sustainable development goals. But it's also essential that we think from the bottom up. So microfinance, the theme of, of the book we're launching today, and also basic income, a concept that we discuss in the accompanying booklet that we're also putting on the table today. Both of these concepts have always rather focused on the other end of the scale. Not billions of dollars, but billions of people. Not huge amounts of money, but small amounts of money. So the th reason for this concern, we have more than 750 million people in the world today trying to live on less than $1.90. That's the World Bank definition of extreme poverty. And many more struggle to live on what countries themselves define as a poverty level. Even in the richest countries, rising poverty is a problem for many. Alongside the moral and social concerns about impoverishment, there's the additional twist that comes with the knowledge that leaving people in abject poverty is choking domestic markets and choking government efforts to reboost economies that have been uh, very slow since the economic crisis. And these small increases in the incomes and livelihoods of billions of people don't get the same kind of media attention that goes to the billions of dollars of big infrastructure funds or new projects. But they should do, because the human impact on health and welfare and happiness is profound. And both large and small, top and bottom, need to go hand in hand for sustainable, inclusive development. So the Routledge book that we're launching today had its origins in an UNCTAD expert meeting on microfinance and debt and development held in Peru two years ago. The meeting aimed to understand better the downside risks of the microcredit model. These risks have been evident for quite some time, but seem to be ignored by an international development community that appeared to be in a kind of a thrall to this so-called poverty reduction mechanism that appeared to be able to repay itself and even make a profit. And the evidence that borrowers, usually women, that borrowers were becoming trapped in debt bondage, bullied by the social compliance mechanisms used to enforce it, repaying rates that were so many percent over what they should be, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, quite common, and without developing the sustainable generating opportunities for income that was supposed to be the whole point of this mechanism. But despite all of this, people continued to believe that microfinance was a win-win. And my own involvement in the reappraisal of microfinance in the early 2000s made me very aware of the need for a more critical view, but also how difficult it is to challenge this rosy perception of this so-called fabulous product. So I'm really proud of my UNCTAD colleagues on the panel today who have produced this really definitive assessment of what went wrong with microcredit. What's also really clear in the book, and which wasn't clear in the early 2000s to the same extent, is that the rise and fall of microcredit fits squarely into the bigger story that UNCTAD has been telling for a few years now about the financialized and globalized world, where even the smallest far-flung outposts of microcredit programs have become part of an enormous machine, which is exploitative and has strayed far from what a financial system is supposed to do. Richard and Stephanie will, in their presentations today, I expect, give more on this context, this global context. And our other speakers, Daniel and Milford, I'm anticipating will focus particularly on the microcredit aspects of today, today's launch. So let me just introduce very briefly who we have at the table. Well, on my right, I think you know these faces very well, Richard Kozel Wright the Director of uh, Globalization and Development Strategies, and Stephanie Blankenberg, the head of the Debt and Development Branch. Both my colleagues in the office, I'm very proud to say. Um, on the far left, we have, I just want to say weighing in on the far left, we have Milford, who, Milford Bateman, who's a visiting professor of economics at Yuri Dobrila University in Pula in Croatia, and also professor of development studies at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Canada. And on his right, we have my new colleague in the office, Daniel Muniva, who has joined UNCTAD from the University of Texas, Austin, and before that, advisor on fiscal issues to the Ministries of Finance in Greece and Colombia, and also advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ecuador. 
So our plan is that um, our speakers will take uh, 10 minutes. I have a little two-minute piece of paper that I'm going to try and, uh, and control us all with. And then there will be plenty of time for question and ask answers and debate afterwards. And we hope to provoke some lively discussion. So please feel free to, to engage with us. So I'm turning the floor to Milford, please. Thank you very much, Diana. That's, uh, that's very nice of you, and it's really good to be, uh, to be back here. Um, as Diana said, the genesis of the book was um, uh, an UNCTAD expert meeting we had in Peru, where we were wanting to really look at the, uh, uh, take a more critical angle, because there were various things happening in Latin America the, uh, to, r related to the microcredit model, which were not really developmental and we're getting extre uh, uh, we were getting uh, extremely worried about uh, many people in, in governments and UNCTAD in particular. So we started with that and um, I have to say things have only got worse since then and in the course of even putting the book together several of the countries started to decline. One of the countries I'll talk about in particular, Cambodia, um, is on a bit of a knife edge at the moment. So that basically, uh, the, the urgency was even more because this really is an issue that needs to be tackled in whatever way, uh, we, uh, way we can. I'll just summarize, I mean, the aim of the book was really to um, summarize the mounting problems against a background of the wider international development community still having faith for a number of reasons I'll come on to um, in the microcredit model, which then became the microfinance model, which then sort of evolved into what's now called financial inclusion. So it's very telling that the international development community rarely caught, talks about microcredit and microfinance anymore. It talks about this new uh, uh, thing called financial inclusion. So it's a, bit, it's a bit of a sort of witness protection program for the microcredit model. It goes into this thing called financial inclusion in order to sort of protect itself and to, uh, to, to hide some of the bad things um, that are going on with it, but to keep it alive. We also wanted to provide some individual country examples and not examples on the, on the border uh, 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 that have not really achieved um, uh, the threshold of, of penetration, microcredit penetration. So we wanted to look at what were the so-called best practice countries and then follow them rather than countries that are just starting out um, uh, to move into uh, microcredit. And finally, it was to look, uh, bearing in mind we, we were pretty jaded with the model in the, at the start, um, to look at, to provide more momentum for alternative uh, community-based financial interventions. Uh, the macro level, we had the financial crisis, and at the micro level, we have a financial crisis of a different variety. And I think at both levels, we're looking for some sort of different uh, uh, model. Just a couple of general points, as I say. I think it's pretty much accepted in, um, in the development community the, the limitations, if not the failures, of microcredit uh, as a poverty and local development intervention. I have to stress as a poverty and local development intervention because as a commercial intervention, it's extremely profitable, and that's one of the reasons uh, why it's uh, uh, kept alive. The problems we talk about in the book are issues, for example, of over-indebtedness. Um, whenever you have finance off a leash, uh, bad things happen, and you see in country after country um, where the microcredit model is promoted, you see the build-up of massive uh, amounts of, of debt in communities, in particular in the poorest communities, unproductive debt, debt that can't be repaid. Um, you have meltdowns, very much similar to 2008, and you build unsustainable uh, local economies. So there's no real connection between the amount of microcredit and the building of microenterprises. Um, uh, uh, there's no real connection there uh, in terms of creating a sustainable development trajectory. So after saying all these bad things, and the book says a lot of bad things, why on earth would microcredit still uh, capture the hearts and minds of so many development institutions? Well, there are two things we talk about in the book. Um, ideologically, we're still, we might be at the tail end of the sort of neoliberal project, um, uh, but the whole idea behind it, the whole idea of individualism, individual uh, entrepreneurship and self-help, those are still key imperatives within 
uh, the neoliberal model, a microcredit answers to that. You take away microcredit, you invalidate the whole concept of self-help and individual entrepreneurship in the poorest communities. If you want poor, the, poor, the, 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 the poorest communities to basically stick to individual entrepreneurship as, as an escape from poverty, a potential escape from poverty, and not think about some radical types of things like a developmental state or trade unions or social welfare programs or income distribution or something, then they have to be, uh, you have to validate and keep promoting the idea of individual entrepreneurship. So for the development agencies, that's for them. For investors and CEOs, then it's, uh, it's a gold mine in many countries. The amount, starting with uh, the, uh, the um, IPO of a bank in Mexico in 2007, the microcredit model has really evolved into an enormous financial instrument for enrichment. Get in there either you're in the senior management role or as an investor. These, the big microcredit institutions are clearly commercially oriented. And so those two reasons keep the, keep the idea alive. Just very quickly, I mean, two of the country examples I happen to look at really encapsulate a lot of the problems, perhaps at the extreme, I, I, I will admit. Um, Cambodia started in the non-governmental organization way, as many countries did. But then after 10, 2010, when the biggest microcredit institution did an IPO, everybody piled in because they realized there was a lot of money to be made at the bottom of the pyramid. So the entire sector is now commercially run. It is mainly owned by investment communities in Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, China. Um, and the local economy now is in real difficulty because if you can only get a couple of thousand dollars to do businesses, these are not real businesses. The, the exit rate is very high. And, and the other aspect is that it, it takes money away from more substantive business projects uh, like small or medium businesses, maybe with some technology or whatever, um, which are not really profitable for the banks or the microcredit institutions to look at. Local economies have been dumbed down as a result. So Cambodia is, is an extreme, fascinating example. On the cusp of collapse at the moment, and the government is taking emergency measures to do something. South Africa is another intervention, another country, where after 94 there was big hopes for, for this, in, particularly in the black communities that suffered under the apartheid regime. What happened instead was mass over-indebtedness. The country is, according to the World Bank, the most over-indebted country in the world in terms of number of loans per person, and ultra-competition in local communities, which is basically destroying the social fabric. Uh, social fabric. So everybody's competing for tiny business opportunities. Um, it, it really isn't a recipe that is going anywhere. Um, and awkwardly, the big microcredit banks are making money as never before in history. So this is the new, in South Africa, it's very appropriate to call it the new gold rush. This is something that is making money. And if you look at the large microcredit banks, all the CEOs and the senior managers are creeping up the top 100 richest individual list in South Africa. It's not really a coincidence. So finally, um, Having said all the bad news, there's clearly a model there that, that is in desperate need for critique and for discussion and for looking at alternatives. And we've, po we've pointed out a few in the book, and hopefully this will start a bit more of a discussion, and particularly within the international development community, more concerted support ideologically and financially and technically. We have things like financial cooperatives and cooperative banks, which are the antithesis, the exact opposite of the microcredit model. They're, they serve local communities, they're owned by local communities, and if there's any sort of a, of a surplus, it's reinvested back in those local communities. They've been sidelined because of this mad rush towards commercial microcredit. I think it's time to, to give some rebirth. Same with credit unions. We constantly we're, we're told, well, what will the poor do without access to microloans? Well, what did they do before microcredit came along? They would go to the local credit union, owned by the community. It existed to provide small-scale loans and to provide a safe um, uh, place for savings. They were sidelined very brutally after 1980. There's time to, re to re revisit the legislation, revisit the regulations and technical support, and they can do a lot of good.
And then finally, my background is more into local industrial policy and how we support a more bottom-up uh, uh, development uh, trajectory. And I think that's where local development banks come in and social venture funds. These are community-owned, maybe municipally-owned, city-owned. There's some fantastic experience out there in places like starting in Japan, then moving on to the eight other Asian economies. China is a great example of credit, of, of sort of credit unions uh, and urban and rural credit cooperatives of, of providing solid finance, long-term patient capital to businesses with a perspective, not just simply here today, gone tomorrow businesses, promoting a bottom-up structural transformation project uh, uh, so I think the, those are the sorts of alternatives that we need to be looking at. We have talked about it in the book, but I think the book is more about dismantling a narrative um, uh, which is all-encompassing um, and just we touched upon, upon the idea of constructing a new narrative. But I hope this does lead on to more concerted support, looking at existing models in the Western nations, although the developed countries like Italy, the Northern Italy models, the Spanish model in the Basque region, German models, but also looking at developing country uh, models in the global south, such as in Brazil and Colombia and parts of Asia, which with the right sort of support and validation at the, at the national level, can do great things, but as I said, sidelined because of the mad rush towards a more commercial, a more market-driven financial structure. Um, and we know where that got us at the national level with subprime mortgages. What's been happening at the local level is very similar. And uh, these types of interventions uh, might be the sorts of interventions that will replace a more market-driven uh, individualistic, private sector-led, a more community-driven uh, response to the problems that I think we face. So that's just what I wanted to, uh, to set out some of the aspects to the book. Thank you. It's really splendid timekeeping too. <laughs> Thanks. I think we'll move straight to the second speaker so we can collect all the comments or questions at the end. So we've had a chance to see the whole context. So Daniel, please. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Mil for, for inviting me to participate in this, uh, in this project and uh, write a chapter on, on Colombia. The first time we met with, uh, with Mil for was in Bogota, in Colombia, in 2013, uh, where you were visiting, uh, I think, the Universidad Nacional, yep. if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And at the time, I was working at the Minister of Finance uh, in Colombia. I was part of the team that was working uh, on looking at the implications of the uh, a peace agreement uh, uh, with the main insurgent uh, uh, group in, in Colombia. And one of the issues that was being discussed was precisely how to provide uh, uh, support to the areas most affected by the conflict. And one of the items that kept being raised was we should push microcredit into these this rural areas. And uh, thanks to, to uh, Milford's research, uh, it was very informative in terms of, of raising uh, uh, the red flags that this might involve uh, uh, for these poor regions in the country. So that's kind of a bit of a, of a background. Uh, but beyond that, uh, so you know, I would just like to start with a with a very brief reflection uh, of all of the discussions that have taken place over the last uh, two months, starting with the uh, UN uh, General Assembly, uh, the G20 report of feminine persons, the discussions in Bali of the IMF and the World Bank, uh, just more recently here the World Investment Forum, and then you can start seeing this this narrative that is reiterated in these different uh, uh, forums. Uh, where you have three components that are always part of, of, the, of, the, of the, let's call it mainstream discourse, where on the one hand you have the importance for scale and urgency. Uh, as we all know, there is a need to mobilize large-scale resources to meet the SDGs uh, uh, in, a, in a given time frame by, by 2030. Uh, we need the private sector involvement to, to achieve this, this agenda. So we need public-private partnerships for, uh, for development. 
That's kind of uh, the second component. And then you have a central role for financial innovation as a key mechanism to, to close the financial gaps that arise uh, uh, from meeting the, the SDGs. Now, if you look, this is kind of a, of a ripoff from the uh, diagram presented earlier by Daniela Gabor, and it was inspired by, uh, by her presentation. Uh, but the key question is, that when you look at these uh, at these three elements, so three narrative elements: so scale and urgency, involvement of the private sector, and financial innovation, the three of them uh, are, are are valid in themselves and are valid and are valid concerns. But what lies at the intersection is these policy proposals that we're that we're seeing that go beyond just microfinance, that go at the core at the core of blended finance at the core of the promotion of, of fintech and cryptocurrencies, and more specifically, and to the point of what we're talking now, uh, it's, it's microfinance. The problem is that when we talk about all of these things, and in most of the discussions, they abstract from key concerns that need to be taken into account in order for, for, for these different uh, elements of, of the agenda for financing for development to work properly. This includes the nature itself of, of finance, structural constraints present in developing countries, and of course, country-specific uh, uh, characteristics. Because when you aim to mobilize large amounts of, of finance in short uh, periods of time so using market mechanisms, you create, end up creating more problems that you're trying to solve. Why? Because you end up creating structures that promote uh, rent seeking, misallocation of resources, regula uh, regulatory capture by, by financial institutions, or in that sense, as was pointed out by Milford, uh, and, and, and other issues. Uh, so in order for all of this to work, we need to put in what has been left out. Uh, such as the role of asymmetric information in financial markets, uh, the regulatory capacities at the national level, and the degree of financial development of, his, of, of the countries where, uh, where all of this is being, uh, is being pushed. So I think the book, it's important to highlight, it does, provide a, uh, does a great job at providing a critical look at how this fails in practice in the case of, of, of microfinance, how this approach that abstracts from all of these key elements, uh, uh, it it's, can be uh, problematic. So an example of, of this is what, what happened in the case of, of, uh, of, of Colombia. Uh, so I'm just going to give you the trailer of, of the chapter in the, in, the, in the book, and hopefully you will get the full movie. Uh, so Colombia was a pioneer in the introduction of, of microfinancing in, uh, in Latin America. The first attempts to create uh, uh, microfinance institutions date so back to the late 19, 1970s. And ever since the beginning, they received a steady stream of support through subsidies uh, from the World Bank, from the Inter-American Development Bank, and from the Colombian, uh, and from the Colombian government. What is important is that when you look at the, go at the, do at the documents of the, of, the, of the government where the strategy was, was, was described, the initial goal of, of, uh, of all of these programs was to provide small support to small SMEs as a part of a broader strategy for industrialization for the, uh, for the, for the country. But as the years went by, starting the second half of the 1980s, uh, the need, quote unquote, need to scale the resources and operation of these microfinance institutions led to the disregard of all of the additional support that was being initially given uh, uh, to the companies, that, that, to, the small SME, to the SMEs that were borrowing from, from microfinance institutions institutions in order to favor credit growth. So in order to scale their operation, we cannot give support, we cannot give advice, we have to focus on giving them as much resources uh, uh, as possible. And then it started in the second half of the, 19, of the 1990s, uh, the Colombian government, with the support of the Inter-American Development Bank, started to do a review of basically, more at, at that point, already 15 years of experiences with microfinance in, in, uh, in Colombia. And they all failed to identify any significant impact in terms of development, in terms of growth of the companies in terms of employment or employment uh, uh, quality. And they, and this is a fantastic quote, they, they literally said that probably the most notable success of official microfinance programs in Colombia was the, the advancement of microfinance industry uh, itself. In other words, all of these resources were being pushed to microfinance just so microfinance could grow regardless of the alleged initial goal of, of microfinance as a tool to support uh, industrialization in the, uh, uh, in the country. Uh, so 
after the, we had a, our own financial crisis in Colombia in, in 98, 1999, uh, and then microfinance suffered a process of transformation. So the goal ceased to be support to industrialization, support to SMEs, and then the, the push for, for, for microfinance was let's, it's important that we promote financial inclusion in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, so again, the stream of government and multilateral subsidies uh, continues. Uh, there was an episode of a bailout of the biggest financial uh, microcredit, microcredit institution in Colombia in, in 98. Uh, I didn't put this here, but one of the funny notes of, of, this, uh, of this experience was that the official explanation for the need to bail out this, uh, this microcredit institution was the reputational risk of letting a major provider of microcredit fail for Colombian microfinance industry and for microfinance industry in the region uh, as, a, uh, as a whole. Now, the problem was that all of this support kept going to a small group of large microfinance institutions. So currently, the four top institutions control 80% of the microcredit uh, market in, uh, in, uh, in Colombia. And the interesting thing is that these, these four top uh, providers were all the pioneers of microfinance in Colombia, were a series of non, what was initially a series of, of non-for-profit NGOs that were set up in, in the early 1980s with the support of the government, with the support of the, uh, of the, uh, of the World Bank. And thanks to all of the support, and in one case, the bailout that they, uh, that they received, they kept growing and amassing a, a larger share of the microcredit uh, market in Colombia. In, in what it's interesting, as Milford was, was pointing out, is that Colombia is one of the best examples of how the, this evolution basically led to a for-profit uh, venture, where all of these uh, non-for-profit entities have now transformed over the last 10 years to highly successful private financial uh, uh, institutions that are completely disconnected to any of the so-called uh, uh, social goals that allegedly they had at the beginning. So very briefly, just, just to give you uh, a brief of uh, uh, some, some figures uh, on, on uh, the evolution of microfinance in Colombia. This shows the growth of microfinance. This is a report from, from literally a month uh, uh, ago that shows that over the last seven years, microfinance has experienced a growth of 114 uh, percent. Currently, microfinance in Colombia represents around four billion uh, uh, dollars. The, uh, the the loans provided by uh, by these uh, institutions. Now, what is interesting, and I'm not sure you can actually see it. Uh, so this this is the uh, uh, the average. This this graph shows the average interest rate of microfinance of financial institutions in in, uh, in Colombia the rate at which they at which they lend now if you see the institutions that are in this uh, red uh, red box they are the, the four top fin uh, microfinance institutions in Colombia on average they provide loans uh, of close to 30% uh, interest rate the average in the financial system in Colombia is around 11 11 uh, uh, percent uh, and of course, given their, uh, their high lending rates, they enjoy a massive intermediation rate because they are able to uh, obtain uh, subsidized resources from the, from the central bank, from the government, and then lend these resources at exorbitant uh, interest rates. And of course, they manage to pocket a sizable amount of money with rates of intermediation of close to 20 uh, to 20 percent. Now, this model of High, high, high interest rates, large intermediation uh, uh, benefits translate, and I'm sorry that this looks too small, but basically currently in Colombia, the, two, the top two most profitable financial institutions of the country are the two largest providers of microfinance uh, in, 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 in Colombia. Uh, rep they have a return of assets above 3%, uh, uh, 3 which is relatively large, given that the average in Colombia is around 1%. So they're basically three times more profitable uh, than the rest of the financial system in the, uh, in the country. So they are uh, capturing massive, massive profits, but what about the people that they lend to and that they allegedly serve to. Uh, uh, each month, each, three, each, uh, each quarter, the Central Bank of Colombia publishes a report on the situation of, of creditors in the, in the country. And it's interesting because all of, the, all of the signs point to a massive problem of over-indebtedness, where when, they, when the, when the uh, microfinance institutions are asked about why 
what are their main concerns that they have in terms of providing more, more credit, the top three reasons why they point out that they are not uh, lending more is because they're worried about the capacity of credit of their, of their, of their borrowers, they are worried about the high levels of debt of their, of their borrowers, and because their borrowers have credits from three or more institutions. Uh, so, yes, and I'm going to, 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 uh, to finish right now. So, it's clear that we need a, a fresh look at, at, uh, at finance and, and, and development, and, you know, that requires going beyond the mainstream narrative, and the first step is to take a critical look at what has actually happened with microfinance. And I think the, the, the book edited by, uh, by Milford, by Richard, uh, by Stephanie, it's an incredibly valuable effort in this, in this area. So, you know, it's, of course, it's not enough just to simply criticize. You need to come up with, uh, with alternatives. And the issue is that they might not be new or shiny, but we already know what has worked in the, uh, 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 in the, in the past. We need to link the mechanisms, the available mechanisms of financial termination with the degree of national development. Uh, we need a central role for public banking and finance, especially in the case of countries with low levels of, uh, of, of development. Uh, we need to actually promote industry, manufacturing industry, and once you start pushing for that, finance will, uh, finance will, will follow. And of course, we need to public, public finance at the service of the public, uh, uh, at the, at the public uh, interest. Of course, you know, you can go to a, to a conference in, in Bali or a shiny presentation in, in London about, about cryptocurrencies, and that's way more fun than going to the library here and getting books that are sadly out of, uh, out of print uh, but the point is, is that the fact that these are all ideas doesn't mean that they are not actually more effective in terms of providing financing, as the representative of Cuba was pointing out earlier, that are actually uh, providing finance and development uh, in uh, poor countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to, I think, what did we say, the order? Richard, to, me. to you, over to you. Okay, thank you, Danny. Um, I won't take very long. I, you know, as an editor, editors don't have to know very much. That's the joy of being an editor. So I, 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 um, I'm very much free riding on the skills and knowledge of other people in this in in this position. As Diana said at, in, in her introductions, the work that we've done on financialization obviously tends to take a macroeconomic perspective on the fragilities and uh, inconsistencies of a, of a highly financialized world. Um, and, and most of our work has been pitched at that level. Um, I first came across Milford's work, interestingly enough, when I moved to Dessa. Jomo is back there, so he will remember because he brought me there. Um, to take over the World Economic and Social Survey in 2007. And that survey was on economic insecurity, was the overarching theme of that report. And there were chapters on uh, conflict-ridden countries, on natural disasters and the, the, the economic damage from disasters, on macroeconomic fluctuations and cycles and shocks. And then there was a chapter at the end of it, a wrap-up chapter on policy, which to my abhorrence was all about the wonders of microfinance as, as the way to deal with the problems of economic insecurity in developing countries. And it's not a, it was not an area that I knew a lot about, but it just felt wrong when I read the various uh, contributions that we'd commissioned uh, for that for that chapter and and in an attempt to get a more sensible grasp of the challenges, I discovered milford 's work um, as an alternative to the microfinance um, hullabaloo that was actually going on inside the UN very much at that moment in time because it kind of pushed all the buttons right it it was it was as Milford said sold as a win-win option it was gender sensitive which was increasingly important it had celebrities uh, kind of running along after it we quote Hillary Clinton as the first person in, in, in the introduction that opens up the discussion micro micro credit is a macro idea. Eunice had just won the Nobel Prize for peace. 
um, on the back of the uh, efforts of the Brahmin, uh, of the Grameen Bank. So, and, it, so, and I think the UN had actually created a, a, a year of micro credit a couple of years. It's, it's, typically, the UN kind of jumped onto a bandwagon for serious problems that they didn't really understand. Um, and so we tried in, in, that, in that 2008 report to, to at least you know, bend the stick back towards a more sensible view of the dangers of, micro, of, of microfinance, drawing on parallels that we saw with the uh, increasing uh, insecurities and vulnerabilities of an, a highly financialized macro uh, world. And, and it was interesting. The parallels were kind of were, were kind of obvious. This this was a pon my, microfinance was clearly a lot of Ponzi financing was going on in the finan in, in the finan in the microfinance uh, world. There was a huge amount of fraud going on already apparent in that world. And and people have kind of written fraud and rent-seeking behavior out of the story of the financial crisis. But the financial, behind the financial crisis, as we know from the work of people like Bill Black and, and Akerlof and Roma and, 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 and Jamie Galbraith, you know, fraud was inherent in the macroeconomic financial story, and it was certainly highly present in the, in the microfinance story. So, so we began to see in that world of microcredit, microfinance, um, many of the problems that we were investigating at the more macroeconomic level. And, and so I think there was a kind of meeting of minds in terms of, of the work that we were doing in GDS and the work that Milford was doing in, in examining the nature of microfinance. So that was, that I think that was something that, we, that, that resonated with us. And I think the other point that I think is very important, and again, Milford's work has been very helpful to us in that respect. It's not just offering a critique of microfinance that is required. It's also offering the alternatives that he laid out in terms of alternative financing institutions, uh, local development states, um, uh, cooperative uh, arrangements uh, in terms of uh, the productive economy. And, and, and I, I think, I think you know, the, the work that we try and present in here is, is to a fairly large extent critique of what has happened, but, but there is a new stage to this work that I think antis anticipates a better way of using finance to deliver on the sustainable development goals and, and development uh, goals more generally that doesn't fall for the simplistic solutions that tend to uh, uh, accompany the much of, still accompany much of the discussion on, on, on microfinance, and as Milford said, increasingly in this new literature on inclusive uh, finance, which has become the new buzzword. I, I mean, if you put inclusive in front of, uh, uh, of any noun, the UN will jump on it immediately. Inclusive trade, inclusive technology. Inc I mean, that, that, it's, it's the new way of gaining legitimacy in the, in, in, the, in the international community, unfortunately. But behind that, usually, is a series of poorly argued, empirically unfounded uh, uh, solutions to very, very serious uh, development challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. You get another five minutes if you want to speak. Sorry? I said you get another five minutes. Richard was very brief. Yep, you know, that's perfectly fine by me. <laughs> um, so I suppose uh, um, to, to, to round this discussion up and also uh, f from the same perspective Richard spoke from in terms of uh, uh, the um, macroeconomic analysis of developmental processes uh, advocated in, uh, uh, at the very least in uh, this division here that's sitting here. Um, we also pose the question, of course, of alternatives. And Milford raised uh, some of the examples, i.e. the alternatives to, to, to um, microcredit and microfinance that has become yet another victim of corporate renterism and of um, intransparent, fraudulent, and predatory uh, 
lending and is particularly insidious, of course, because it um, extends its technical technicals uh, to the very poorest. <coughs> In, uh, in particular in developing country. We have that on the one hand. So the alternative for microcredit in, uh, in this sending of failure of this particular model are local credit uh, unions, uh, unions, are local uh, cooperatives, are uh, decentralized regional banking systems that uh, work together with these uh, cooperative and union-based uh, credit Institutions Now, of course, this is not new. It's, as usual, back to the future since these existed. There are many um, examples from quite some time back, uh, primarily in agriculture, but then also moving into other sectors, both in the nowadays uh, developed world, uh, in particular the country I'm coming from, Germany has a tradition in this regard, um, had, I should say, emphasis on D, had a tradition in this uh, regard that no longer really exists. Um, but also developing countries such as Vietnam, China has been mentioned here uh, too. Now, um, these, these are the obvious alternatives to look back to and, and perhaps forwards, and Milford seem to be quite optimistic that we've seen the tail end of neoliberalism. I'm not quite sure whether we're not just moving to the next worst stage, but um, we'll have to see about that. Um, now, in terms of alternatives, <coughs> what, we, uh, what we looked at as well uh, from the macro perspective, is what would it require to return to that kind of local uh, credit provision structure that operates from an understanding of uh, credit and credit creation being a public good and uh, um, servicing uh, public local interest, so to speak. Now, <clears throat> Um, the point is, of course, that uh, what developing countries need um, to, to uh, from a fi finance perspective, uh, promote structural transformation is the ability to raise public funds and the ability uh, to build banking systems uh, that uh, um, retain credit creation under public control so that this can be channeled uh, into structural transformation, including at the local uh, and lower um, levels. Why is it so difficult uh, to, to achieve this? Why uh, does microcredit become what it has become in terms of the uh, largely, essentially um, uh, fraudulent um, business, on large business? Um, it has, of course, to do with uh, the reason why developing countries find it very really difficult in, in other areas to develop uh, or to adopt seriously developmental policy, namely uh, because they have very little policy space uh, in the current global economy to do so. We have, from a financial point of view, on the one hand, an international monetary system uh, that has been operating under a lead currency uh, that, is a, that remain, remains a lead currency <clears throat> for historical reasons, but that has not fulfilled that role for the past uh, 30 years, but has instead uh, abused that role systematically over that um, period. The idea of a lead currency is that uh, the country in question puts collective global interests above national interests, and the opposite, of course, has been the case ever since uh, the 1970s. That is, from an, uh, from, a, from an international economic perspective, one of the reasons, of course, that, on the other hand, uh, the issues that uh, Richard raised and summarized as well, uh, uh, corporate rentierism, financialization, i.e. the uh, uh, ever faster expansion of short-term financial interest and uh, um, uh, profit as well as rent-seeking into uh, areas that would have been um, recognized as belonging under public control, including um, development policy, uh, but many other um, areas, of course. Uh, has, it has been able to expand to this extent and has also been a, a, a context in which uh, the current volatility that we see in international financial markets, the expo exposure to international financial markets, the, uh, um, the um, abandonment of advanced country sense of responsibility for uh, um, providing adequate and substantive development finance has been abundant. That on the one hand, <clears throat> and on the other hand, we must of course forget that once these mechanisms take place, and in the microcredit case, uh, or make micro debt case, that is very obvious, especially in smaller developing countries that anyway operate with relatively 
uh, young, sometimes weak uh, institutional structures, uh, a massive presence of these microcredit uh, institutions puts pressure on a nascent public monetary uh, and credit creation system anyway. So there come pressures from below in micro terms and pressures from outside exogenous in terms of the international monetary uh, system. So when that is the case, what uh, it's obviously very difficult to see that there can be the kind of national, perhaps regional, international policy or, or, or coordination that would be required to provide adequate uh, development finance, and that would be uh, 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 an agenda, an alternative agenda that first of all scales development finance up uh, in, in a very massive way. Secondly, that makes sure that that development finance is channeled to domestic investors and to the creation of uh, domestic uh, investors or even a class of investor that can create the profit that can be reinvested uh, in that economy and not towards uh, shareholders of uh, um, dubious <clears throat> large corporations with the capacity of lobbying uh, those in charge of development agenda uh, worldwide and including in the UN, <laughs> has to be said. Now, um, we looked very briefly towards alternatives if we, if we will not have a, a, a political consensus at the international level to tackle some <laughs> Uh, such difficult thing as the international monetary system uh, um, fast enough for there to, uh, to be a, a response to the urgency of the need of development finance, what can be done? And we are looking into, and I won't go into too much detail here, we are looking into, um, uh, into what developing countries amongst themselves can do. Um, once uh, uh, that does not take away the, 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 the demand of responsibility on advanced economies, but at least what can be done in terms of uh, mechanisms to strengthen regional internal credit creation to, to, to be able to um, gain some, uh, at least some more independence uh, uh, from the dollar in particular, uh, and a number of possibilities, but also then in that context at uh, sub-national development bank banks, uh, uh, banking systems, decentralized banking systems geared uh, towards specific sectors, for example, and that are tied in with uh, cooperative or, or union-based credit, uh, local credit institutions. So the argument there is largely that if there ever is to be a bottom-up transformation, and I think one has to, one has to be reminded of some skepticism, um, I, I'll just say one word more on this, uh, but if there is to be a bottom, what Milford referred to as bottom-up transformation, there has to be a very dense network at the local, local at the national, at the regional uh, level, level in, uh, in the South. And uh, that, of course, calls on the agenda from a UN perspective, South-South cooperation in this case in, in, in the context of development finance as a matter only for developing countries and not a matter uh, for advanced country to have any uh, uh, discretionary uh, power <coughs> uh, over this. So uh, a, a concern that does actually not belong in the UN. Um, in terms of, uh, I think I'm, Richard will correct me if he thinks that's not quite a, a correct reflection of the thinking uh, of microeconomics at UNCTAD, <coughs> or at least part of UNCTAD. Uh, I think that even if this was possible, and it's certainly what we're saying is it, we, we've got to start moving, and in the current situation that is a place to start, uh, that does not um, mean that there does not have to be another form of transformation at the global level, and there is just nothing that will move us forward that does not include uh, the reigning in and basically uh, the, the, the uh, elimination of uh, what we have described as corporate rentierism in decentralized international financial markets. So whether we like it or not, um, that certainly is not something that should be understood to therefore not be uh, on the agenda, but to get started bottom up also is an option in our view. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you all our speakers. Really great presentations, very, very interesting and also in good time as well. So we have, uh, we have plenty of time to have some discussion. Um, so just maybe to, to try and put a frame on what all the speakers have said, we've heard that if microfinance might have started off at the beginning with some uh, good intentions and some benign um, objectives, things uh, changed rather rapidly. 
there's a kind of a paradox that this whole sector of um, of credit needs that was considered to be so unprofitable that no one would touch it and people were unbanked and unbankable. In Colombia, they turn out to be the most profitable sector of, of the whole of the finance system. And I suspect that's not the only country that has that experience. So we find that uh, microfinance is like a litmus test of the entire financial system. And what we see at this typically domestic and bottom up mechanism has become globalized, corporatized, financialized, and massively profitable and not serving the original needs for which it was designed. Um, all the speakers have constant, have, have um, highlighted the fact that, um, that uh, subsidies or government support has somehow been co-opted. You know, it was initial part of microfinance and now somehow it's been turned into bailing out of big institutions that remain um, either highly concentrated or extremely profitable. Um, and so this is very ins especially insidious. I mean, it's bad for the financial system as a whole, but especially insidious for services that are aimed at the poorest. So all of our speakers are also trying to look at positive ways that we move forward, um, whether it's at the smaller and domestic level, thinking about cooperatives or um, local public banking, uh, regional financial agreement agreements, or certainly the global reforms that are needed as well, including some of the largest and, and most long-standing global reforms that UNCTAD has been talking about for a long time. Um, I think I'd like to turn it over to the floor now and